All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, IPFS camp tend to be a nice event. So, um, all right. So I'm Joel, um, co-founder of Threepox Labs, and we're the creators behind Ceramic. Today, I'm going to be talking about how Ceramic is being used to uh, secure at least a small proportion of the scientific record, but I think the model of this can actually be expanded um, there, because there's like some really real benefits. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to talk about the problem. Uh, so part of the problem is that we, data is really like a core piece of science. Um, when we do science, we do experiments, we gather data and we use that data to sort of come up with some sort of insights. Um, and science is becoming a lot more data heavy as the sort of nuances and things we're trying to do science on uh, is more sort of complicated. We need more information to be able to actually gain those insights. And this data is, and the growing data sets that we need to do science are actually really important for us to actually reproduce experiments. And uh, one way I like to think about that is, is in software engineering, we write tests. And if you want to know that our code works and is, is sort of reproducible, we, we have tests and you implement things that conform to the tests. And reproducing science without data, I think is sort of similar to like writing software without tests. Uh, you can do it, but it's like really hard. Um, and in addition to just like the data, we also have, um, well, so specifically for, for data, like we have problems with um, right now, most data being used to produce scientific papers is proprietary and not really widely available. And even if it is available, it's sort of difficult to validate the integrity of that data. And now as we're getting more connected and have been getting more connected for a long time, um, we really want to be able to gather data from more sources, right? Like we don't want data to be captured just by this small group of scientists that are doing this experiment. Ideally, we can have like a lot of people and citizens contributing data uh, at a larger scale. And of course that comes with more challenges if we don't have a way to prove integrity and some sort of reputation over that data. But beyond this data, we also have challenges with publication, right? Uh, many of you might be aware of this, but like journals, scientific journals are not really open for citizens. Uh, institutions pay for uh, getting access to the research in these journals. And uh, of course, like governments generally pay for institutions to do research and citizens pay for governments, but citizens actually get access to the result, which is kind of like weird, right? And these journals have peer review systems but um, they're not really credibly neutral. They're sort of like very tied to this group of scientists that have this like inside knowledge of these uh, and sort of this group that are tied to these journals, right? Um, and I think we can do a lot better. We can have open protocols to do this that are uh, more credibly neutral and that requires sort of less trust in these like journals and institutions. Um, so, what if we could know for sure when the data was first published, who actually published that data? And we could know that no one, since that data was published, no one had actually tampered with that data. And what if we had this as a fundamental building block to create a scientific feedback loop, where it's much more easily to have a wide range of people um, contributing data, crowdsourcing data, and we have potentially a way to reward those people retroactively. Um, I think another thing that would be interesting to explore is could we leverage real-time data uh, more in science? Um, and as we do this, can we have sort of standardized schemas around this data to uh, enable better interoperability between uh, different research efforts? Um, so I think we can actually do this by uh, notarizing data sets in uh, using some of the cryptographic primitives that we're talking about here today, right? Like data fingerprints, cryptographic hashes, uh, you know, in IPFS it's called CIDs. Uh, strong identity is something that generally is available in the, in the crypto space. It's like have a public key, sign things, 
so you have like a tie-in to uh, where data actually came from. And secure timestamping. Like a lot of timestamps in the current world relies on some, trusting some institution to provide a timestamp. But we have blockchains, right? That's much better. We can actually have timestamps that are extremely hard and expensive to tamper with. Um, okay, so how would we go about building something like this, right? Like uh, we could potentially put a bunch of stuff on IPFS, but generally IPFS only provides sort of the, the fingerprint aspect of things. Like we put a file and we get a hash of it. We don't really have an easy way to mutate things and we don't really have a good way of attributing who did it or when it happened. There is sort of IPNS, but it's like a little bit hard to use. Or maybe we can just like put all this data on the blockchain. Uh, and there is great because we get who did it and we get when it happened. But the problem there is it's just like generally very expensive to put all of your data on chain and uh, very expensive for like everyone using it to just like pay for every transaction. And in both of these, um, these approaches, like on IPFS or on blockchain, we also have the pri problem of privacy. We generally just like would put the data into the public. So ideally we have something that's like a little bit in the middle. And so that's where the project that I've been working on uh, called Ceramic comes in. Uh, essentially it's a peer-to-peer -peer data management system uh, that uh, we built to enable large scale data um, collection management where end user can sign data that gets captured there. So in the same way blockchain, you have to sign transactions. The data is periodically timestamped on the blockchain. And you can run this much more cheaply than having to run you know, a blockchain network where you have a lot of nodes uh, that need to come to consensus. Um, and one of the things we're working on is also like enabling people to run nodes more privately um, without having to reveal all this data to the public while still getting the benefits of uh, cryptographic hashes, signatures, and uh, on-chain uh, timestamps. Uh, so yeah, as I mentioned, all, all the data on Ceramic is timestamped on Ethereum. Um, every object that's written to Ceramic is made up of a hash-linked event log, which gives the ability for the controller, the owner of that data, to mute that, mutate that object over time. And this is sort of represented in IPLD, which is this IPFS compatible data structure. And we built a custom libp2p protocol that allows us to easily replicate the entire data set of all the data on Ceramic or any sort of subset of that data down to like an individual object or all the objects for like a specific user. And all this data is attributable and signed by end user wallets. Um, so we can see who authored what thing. And if we have a large network of contributors, we can sort of look at this graph of contributions and potentially think about uh, how we would want to reward the contributors um, over time. And so double click on, to double click on this, uh, this is sort of how it works. So um, every node in the network sort of have, has this concept of global timestamping. And how it works is the node, it collects a bunch of events that comes in from all the end users. Those are signed and verified. And periodically, uh, the node builds a Merkle tree and sends one transaction onto um, the Ethereum blockchain. And in one transaction, we essentially like timestamp thousands of events at a time. So we get a much cheaper way of having these like tamper-proof timestamps. And for the individual object level, we have this event block, right? So as on the bottom here, you can see that there's like a, a Genesis event and then there's a timestamp and then you can see there's some data events of like updating that object um, and then maybe a timestamp again. And so you can see how like a, an individual object can evolve over time. All right, so how, how is this like <laughs> low level description actually something that you can use? Uh, well, these, uh, this event sourcing system is used to like create databases. So OrbisDB is a, an example of a database built on top of Ceramic. And they basically just take this event fees, feeds um, and builds an, an SQL index. And you can query that using SQL or Graph, uh, GraphQL. And they also have a UI for creating the data schemas for your application. And so this allows you to like have a more traditional way of interacting with uh, your data and your databases while 
the the sort of underlying system is is this like um, tamper proof system uh, that's still like highly scalable. Okay, so um, that's sort of like the, the the basics. And so like, how is this actually in practice used for uh, the scientific record? Well, so there's a few projects I would like to highlight. One is called coordination network. So coordination network, you can think of like this open knowledge graph, which uh, projects can use to map out different parts of their research flow. Uh, so they, they worked really hard on making LLMs really useful for researchers uh, when they want to roadmap how to sort of reach the research goals. Uh, in addition, they can also like uh, use that to create tech trees. So a tech tree is a way to have, if you have some like far out there um, goal, let's say you want to build a Dyson sphere, right? That's like far into the future. But like what, what are the subcomponents? Like what is the technology you need to like research first in order to eventually build up to this like uh, far out sci-fi idea? And so you can of course apply that to like closer term things as well. Um, but if we start building out these tech trees, we can start to have more shared understanding of what it takes to get to future like really ambitious goals. Uh, they also use this system to um, do sourcing to find the researchers that might be useful in different fields um, and to gather evidence and also have a system for like reviewing proposals and drafting proposals and all of these like artifacts that are being created from all this like road mapping and tech trees and all this is persisted on ceramics so you can see um, who contributed this individual piece and when did that happen uh, and they were, want to eventually use this data to provide by bounties or like retroactively rewards the researchers that participate in this network. Uh, another project that is really cool is DSI Labs. And they're creating a system for digital research artifacts, which is basically your research paper plus all of the things that was necessary to uh, create your, um, the, the sort of results that, that came out of that. So that might be, you know, a bunch of data, it might be some code. Uh, you, they also enable you to include like presentations and make the research more digestible. Um, and they use ceramic to have a way to store sort of different versions of these objects um, with cryptographic in, uh, integrity so that you can look at the research. Maybe you can look at previous versions of the research and see sort of how it evolved over time and also enable anyone to sort of run a node and replicate this data. And I think one thing they're exploring on top of is like these research artifacts is like, how can we do more credibly neutral and decentralized peer review systems? Another one that I would like to highlight is Index Network. And so what they built is essentially a discovery protocol for the open web. And so one example of this is of course, knowledge graphs. Um, but essentially what it does is it uses LLMs to create vector embeddings of various different public data sets. Um, so that could be like a uh, knowledge graph, like the one coordination work network is building, or it could be uh, forecaster discussion channels, uh, or it could be pro different projects uh, documentation. So they actually have uh, one of these um, uh, data set for the, the, the ceramic documentation. Um, and this enables you to do like semantic search over all this data. But I think the thing that Index does that's really cool is that you don't subscribe to channels or other users in their network. You can actually subscribe to a semantic search. So imagine you're interested in football and you wanna see like all of the hat tricks that happen. So you can search like hat tricks in football and then get a notification every time that happens. So imagine using that for uh, creating a subscription for the research topic that you're interested in and getting updates in real time when, when new discoveries are happening. All right, so I think that, that's sort of like um, the projects I wanted to highlight. And then in addition to this, there is Surscan. And Surscan sort of is this data explorer on Ceramic that allows you to read all of the data that's been written publicly to the network. And so here, all the things from these different pro projects I mentioned should appear and you can sort of browse and verify 
everything. And you can see things like, you know, who was the author, what schema was used, and, and when was this data indexed. All right, so thank you. And if you wanna get involved, you can reach out to our team at this chat, which links to Discord. Also, if you remove chat, you'll get to our general website and information. Thanks.